Joshua and Moses for 30 days, Deuteronomy chapter 20, 34, 8, and it's time to get back to work. Joshua was the next leader, commander-in-chief, Numbers 27, I'll give you those verses. Even though Joshua might not have sensed the responsibility as yet, it's interesting to learn about Joshua just to see where God was sharpening him for the work at, at this time. The Bible tells us to know them that rule steersmen, steersmen, over us. We found that in the book of Hebrews, remember, in chapter 13, verse 7 and verse 17, and also in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. But we fail in our admonition. So many just maybe we can get a little insight as we study Joshua. Leadership is important position. But we have to be careful as we study the two leaders, Moses and Joshua. They are leaders of a nation. They're leading a nation, not a church. When they develop their tribal land, they will have leader, a, a leader, mainly elders, over them. The pastor is to lead, not dictate. The church is to follow, not push. Whereas God called his leader Moses and Joshua, he has called leader, his leaders for church. They have delegated over those the church has called to be servants, which we call deacons. Right there is an interesting thought, and I could spend the whole class time in that. We, we are so off base on how we do things, okay? And I don't say that um, critically to the point of condemnation or anything like that, but we, we all make our mistakes. And, and if we study Israel from the time from Abram right on through to the time that Jesus came, you can see a total uh, upheaval within that nation. And all of it came through their leaders. Okay? So the concept of a leader is very uh, ignorant to us. We all have our opinions. We all have our ideas. We all, to a certain degree, have studied the Bible and we form our opinion of what we see, but not what we should understand. Now, when you start studying a leader in the church, you find out that is a bishop, okay? Not according to the Episcopalian, not according to the Presbyterian. They have a bishop rules over, okay? This, this is a pastor. He's called a bishop. He has an extreme responsibility over the whole church. He's also a shepherd, the leader, okay? Now, I look at these things myself and over the years try to tweak a lot of this. But I'll say this, congregations hurt the situation. Okay? As a bishop, he's in charge. When you study the book of Acts, chapter 6, the apostles, how many were there? Who was the leader? Who was the bishop? Who was the main bishop? Peter. The Lord appointed him as that. And then later on, the church removed him from that position because they got irritated him because he went to the Gentiles. That was part of his responsibility as being an evangelist. Okay? So, so when you look at the picture, they appointed some elders, some deacons, to serve tables. I want you to notice when you study that portion of Scripture, they delegated these people in their positions. Okay? Uh, we have church uh, government. We delegate. No, no. He delegates. The church, yes, selects and puts in. But he delegates their position. Did, did you ever stop and realize that some churches have an, a, a great... Uh, South Haven is interesting to me. 
It, it's, it has never shut down because of COVID or anything like that, because of leadership and because of good advice. Okay? Then they have elders that are demo, uh, motivated by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, and they get together and they look at things and they present things. And, and so they still have their Sunday school intact, they still have all of it, and, and it impresses me. But I've also seen that with other churches. And as I look at the structure, I see delegation. I see delegation. I see leadership. Okay? And, and that's what churches need is leadership. Are you following me? And that individual is giving God's permission to lead according to God's leadership. So the pastor is an under-shepherd of the main shepherd. And so he has an awesome responsibility to listen to what the Spirit of God is saying and to move that church forward spiritually in an administration that is pleasing to God. When you study Corinthians, you'll find out that, that the Spirit of God put situations in place. There was one that spoke in tongues. There was one that did this. There was one that, not, not a plurality, but one. And the pastor dedicated these areas. Now say, for instance, you have a church, let's talk about ours. And I'm not getting on anybody, please. Brother Hess, he's been in the ministry for quite some time. Okay? Let's take Brother Larry. Okay? I'm not picking on them. And let's take myself. Let, let's take Brother Mark. Okay? These are what we call elders in the church. But two of us have extreme responsibilities to God because of our calling. Can you imagine what would happen if we would loosen up and delegate certain areas of teaching that these people can do? Like for instance, I'd say, Brother Hess, I want you to teach on this in the next three Wednesday nights. Brother Johnson, I want you to preach on this in the next three Sunday nights. It's things that we need to know. It's things we need to understand because what we're competing against in the world. And Brother Larry, you're well versed in business, so I'd like you to bring out on Wednesday night after Brother Hess gets through, I want you to bring out three lessons on business relation in the church. You see? So, so we have that. And I, I've, I've had church. Our pastor, uh, one of our pastors called a man, and he was a fantastic Christian. And he said, would you come and tell us about the business side of God's work? And this man was in business, but he was a number one Christian. And everything he did tied everything to the word of God. Now, when you go to Colossians, you find that Paul gave a list of people. You go to Romans chapter 16, Paul gave a list of individuals that were beneficial to the ministry, even though they were not apostles, even though they were not called to be preachers. They were people of God taking their position seriously, serving the Lord. You follow me? So, so this is what you find when you start looking at leadership. So when you get into Joshua, the first thing to, to draw a line is what his name means. Okay? Uh, later on you're going to see in this chapter, and we're not going to have time to get to it, you're, you're going to see that, that uh, Joshua, when he finally got to, got to work, called this group of people together. I might have used hand these out. In Numbers chapter 1, it gives you a list of these individuals. And I ask you to look at that real close because they are defined by, they're expressed by their names. I'm giving you a list of their names and I'm giving you on that what their name meant. And while you're looking at that, see how important it is to have people put in position that are expressed by their character, by their namesake. When you got a good name, you got a good character. Can I get an amen on that? So, so when, when you get down here in Joshua in verse uh, 10 or 11, you're going to find those, where those will come in. So I doubt if we'll get to them, but I just wanted to hand those out to you. The first thing Joshua's name means is Jehovah the salvation. 
the same thing that shows up with Christ. So that when you look at that and try to get a broad spectrum of what all of this is about, we're seeing something. I call it leadership. Okay? I call it leadership. Joshua was a sanguine melancholy. That might not mean anything to you in temperament. This is why we understand why he does things at times without forethought and failure to ask, asking God for direction. But God knew him, and he was God's man. He had also two other names. One is Jehoshua, and the other one is Hosea, which compounds down to what we understand as Joshua, Numbers 16, 11, 16, and Numbers 8. So as we look at Joshua, as we get into this thing, number one, jo Joshua was appointed, appointed to select men to go against the Amalekites. Remember, that was the battle when they entered into the promised land. They entered into this battle, not the promised land, but heading to it. They entered into this battle. This was the time that Joshua and, and her, uh, was it, her went up and lifted up the arms of Moses because they realized as long as Moses' arms were lifted up, they won. If his arms went down, they were defeated. We need those kind of people in the, for the pastor. Can I give an amen on that? We need people to lift his arms up. Then when those arms are lifted up to God, we know that there's victory. But if there's the weakening down, there's failure. And we always see that. Okay? Uh, so he was selected as one of these men. Number two, selected to be Moses' servant. Now I ask you to remember that. Selected to be Moses' servant. I, I was asked once uh, by a church. They were, they were having a meeting. And they asked me to come and talk to them and sit in the media and give some advice. And I, they were talking about leadership, and I talk about delegation. I said, do you have men that you can put in position that will lead this up and get it off the shoulders of the pastor and let the pastor do what he's supposed to do? And they just kind of looked at me. I said, do you have anybody in church that you can do that? Well, 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 yes. But, but, but they're not that well learned. Okay, start a class to teach them how to lead. Show them by God's word other individuals that were church members that led out. And you'll start seeing this and they will start growing and they will start teaching because that's exactly what the pastor is supposed to do is teach young men to carry on this responsibility. Okay, now... Over the years, I've had a problem. I've had people come up and say, do I have to surrender the preach to do this? No, because if you study the Bible, you have a bishop, you have what you call preachers that are called, okay? And then you have other individuals that God has laid on their heart to be productive in church ministry. You follow this. So, so you point on the, desi the, the desire. And then you start mentoring those individuals. But I've had individuals say, no, no, I don't want that responsibility. Okay? Today we're living in, I don't want that responsibility. So we're getting less and less. But Brother Marv's getting older. I'm getting older. Brother Hess is still the young one on the block. <laughs> but there's a point that Brother Marr is going to have to step down. There's going to be a point that I'm going to fall down. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is there's nobody to replace us. Because people don't want to be involved. They want to sit in a pew. They want to go home. And that's it. I thought the work of the Lord was a ministry of the people. Okay? And so that's where it comes. When the Lord prompts the heart, even though you say you can't, if the Lord is saying, yes, you can, if I give you the leadership, I will lead you, I will direct you, I will not leave you or forsake you, you'll be able to do it. Put the hand up. 
okay, God, here am I. And then from that point on, it's, he lets it be known, and then the church sets in order mentors to help him. Okay. Joshua was mentored by Moses and not even realizing what was taking place. God was at work. Number three, sent out as one of the spies. You remember those spies that went into the promised land to see how prosperous it was? They all came back except two with bad report. And those two, Joshua and Caleb, stood up for God. Okay? Number four, I like this one. He was picked of one of the 70 to be a counselor in number 11. Now, I like this because when you study Numbers chapter 11, Moses was really under pressure because he had to answer all of these questions. He had to be a counselor with all these people. And he just went to God and he just poured it out and argued with God. God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. He said, I want you to select 70 men. And here's what I'm going to do. Now remember, we're talking about, what, a million people or more? And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take part of that spirit that I have placed on you, and I'm going to place it on them. Do we have something to look at? Do we have something profitable to look at? Do we have something to learn from? Yes. Isn't it the Spirit of God that birthed our spirit? Isn't it the Spirit of God that comes on us to encourage us to do what God wants Him wants us to do? Isn't it the Spirit of God? Now, now when you follow that, they all gathered at the tabernacle like God told Moses to have them do, except two. And they were still over at their tent. And when the Spirit came down on them, or came off of Moses, went on them, it also went on those two. Joshua came to Moses, and he said, no, 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 stop them. They weren't here. Moses said, man, I wished everybody was a prophet. <laughs> you see, we get so pick and choosy, and it's God doing the work. In my ministry of over 50 years, individuals have stepped up to, 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 to be available. They need mentoring, yes. But then I heard through the congregation, they're not taught in the Word of God. They don't need to lead our young people. They don't need to do that. This is where the problem comes. My persuasion is let God do what God wants to do. And listen to the Spirit of God because He's doing the directing. He might not be learned. He might not seem suitable. But God has laid a burden. Now, if it's only flesh in nature, it's going to stop. At some point, they're going to walk away. I don't want that responsibility. They were not called to God. It was a fleshly desire, not a spiritual desire. And leaders of the church are supposed to be looking at that. I did that clear through my ministry. It's looking at the spiritual aspect, not the fleshly. Because remember, I'm sanguine, and I get motivated fleshly. But if I check it out, it's me wanting to do it, not the Lord. So that brings problems if I do it. See, but if God does it, then he is working through it for his glory. And this is what we're finding with Joshua. And then he was picked by God to be Moses' successor. Deuteronomy, Deut 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 I mean, Numbers chapter, uh, chapter 27, 18 and 19. 22 and 27. Let's, let's turn, that, turn that for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 18. <clears throat> 27. Well, I guess I got that one wrong. I got that one wrong. 
uh, 20, let's see. Um, I got that wrong. I apologize on that one. Let me check 22 here. Might have that one wrong too. No, I got that one wrong too. I'll have to get that and get it to you later. But what I was looking at is he was he was uh, numbers. <laughs> That's where I was having a problem. Numbers 27. Yeah. Okay, Numbers 27. Okay. Numbers 27, verse 18 and 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit. Now remember, stop. When did this happen? Chapter 11. Of the Spirit means the Spirit's on him. So that's very important in leadership. Okay. A man is the spirit, see, whom is the spirit, and lay thy hand upon him, and led him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and led him, see, and give him charge in their sight. Verse 22. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and took Joshua and set him before Eleazar, the priest, and before the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him charge, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Do you see anything there worthwhile to look at? Do you see anything there to learn from? Okay, anything else? In the New Testament, when somebody surrendered to ministry, there was a laying on of hands. But yet at the same time, we forgot something. When you go back and study church history, you find out that when a person came into the church, they not only voted to have them come in, they laid hands on them after they were baptized, signifying this is where God's going to use them. We've lost that along the way. We don't lay hands on new members. And so we just get all kinds of stuff in. And before long, we get all kinds of opinions. Before long, we get a lot of distorted thoughts in the church, distorted ministries, all because of a wrong spirit, the spirit of the flesh, not the spirit of God. So when you learn about this need of laying on in hands, it simply has position, position as well as leadership. Okay? I know I had hands laid on me, but the Bible said be very careful. <laughs> be very careful in that. Understand what you're doing. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go to our chapter now. Any question at this point? We haven't even started our lesson yet. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, looking at that from a different perspective, and I studied this in the Hebrew, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but to get the emphasis of what is being done here, God is saying, Joshua, Moses is dead. Get on with it. <laughs> Did you know you could drag your feet for so long that you know, never accomplish anything? Especially when these people wept because of Moses dying. Now, you know, they couldn't find his grave. God buried him. How did he die? I don't know. I came close one day. My heart just stopped. So God might have said, Moses, you're going to die today. He took him up there in the mountain and said, you're going to die today. I don't know. They couldn't find his 
great. Matter of fact, the, the, the ones that are digging with the archaeological spade, those that are ignorant, are still looking for his body. They're digging all through those areas. <laughs> and they're still looking for the body of Jesus, too. But they're going to find either one of them. My brother, my stepbrother said it was a shame that Moses led the children of Israel and died and went to hell. I said, where'd you get that? He said, God killed him and, and buried him, so he went to hell. He didn't say he went to heaven. I said, then what in the world was he doing in the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17? He said, where'd you find that? I said, Matthew, I just told you that. See, we said, we know enough about the Bible to be ignorant. We need enough people to know about the Bible not to be in the correct ignorance. Amen? Amen. To the best we possibly can. So he's told him, he said, he's dead. Now therefore, arise and go over Jordan, thou and all this people, unto a land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now notice in verse 3, every place that thy soul of thy foot shall tread upon that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. Then, then notice the land mass in verse 4. They never accomplished that. We'll get to that later, why, why they didn't. But look at what he's told him to do. And he, he wasn't even aware of what he was being mentored for. <laughs> now that's, that's like somebody surrendered to preach and they go under the the mentoring of the pastor, and uh, it comes to the point that the pastor dies, and God leaves the church to say, I want you to put him in his place. Well, the church will be in shock, probably, but they'll do what the Lord wants them to do, but he will be in much greater shock because he didn't know he was being mentored to be a new pastor. See? I want to ask you a question. Is it wrong for a church to call somebody in the church who's been mentoring by God, by God's men, to be what God wants them to be, and then God says, I want him. Is it wrong to put him in position? Now, I notice I didn't get any head shaking. I got nothing. Is it wrong? If the Holy Spirit leads, it's not wrong. Thank you. How do you know if the Spirit of God is working? In the 50-some years, I have seen more fleshly spirit working than I have Holy Spirit working. How do you know if the Spirit of God is working? Hmm? Well, number one, yeah. Pray. What did they do when they chose the seven to take care of the of the storehouse. They prayed. They sought direction. And the Bible tells us at times that, that the Holy Spirit would bring a unison, an agreement. Wouldn't it be great? Uh, one time here, uh, we had a I had men's meeting, we discussed business meetings and so forth. We had something that was great. And all the men agreed. And business meeting came and we presented it to the church as a committee. And uh, the church voted and one man voted against it. And it was one of the men in the meeting. After service, I went up to him and I said, what's the matter with you? We all agreed. And now we come on the floor and it's presented, and the people understand, and we all agree in unison except you. He said, you don't think I'm going to let this church have a 100% vote, do you? <laughs> yes! And that's what I told him. Yes! I expect that when God's doing the moving. Yeah. See? But you see, you always have people to contend with. Did Moses... <laughs> And Joshua is going to have people to contend with too. Okay? Now, look what he says in verse 5. There shall not any man, the, Greek, the Hebrew, any one be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Whoa. 
Now, I, listen. Who's in charge? <laughs> when you have God on your side, <laughs> okay. Now, there's what you call hooking Bible with the Bible. Okay. Now, I apologize. I, I, I admit my failure. I was here for five years. I kept on hearing the little things. When are you going to leave? You've been here five years. I said, God's not through with me yet. And all of the things that were working were pressing me down. But I was trying to lead in to prayer and looking through God's eyes and sensing what he wants us to do. I would offer it and it was cut down. And I got to the point I, I didn't know what to do. I went to God and I prayed, but it was silent. He says, I sometimes you just have to wait. And I got in a hurry and I resigned. I regretted that. And still today, I regretted that and I told the Lord I regretted that. But he stopped me. I mean, he took me across his lap and he beat me. I went to Oklahoma to a place that hurt painfully. If I told my wife I, they asked me to come back and preach and view the call, it'd be grounds for divorce. <laughs> it was that bad on my family. But I had to learn to set, set, and take the pain until the Lord said, okay, it's time to leave. And I did. But I had to learn because I did something regretfully. I don't know what would have happened if I'd have stayed but the fight, the fight, the fight that I had constantly drove me down. And so I left and I went back to school. I got fortified, had greater things to work, greater tools to use, came back, more matured, thinking, boy, I'm going to do it. No, it still didn't happen. I still, the same people fought me the same way they did the first time. Yes, I was able to counteract that by trying to get us to go to the Lord and look at it from the Lord's perspective. But every time I turned around, it was a fight. A fight. But I had to stay this time until the Lord said, it's time to leave. It's time to leave. They're not listening to me. They're not listening to me. So when a church gets that way, <laughs> so here in Joshua, we learn something. Especially the leaders. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And the same thing in the Hebrew that we found out last week in the Greek, in Hebrews chapter 13. I will, I will never. I will, I will, never. So what it is, is a, is a double repeat to produce a positive. God's saying, I am with you. I have placed you. I have called you. I want you to stand where I want you to stand. And nobody will be able to fight against you. But then we have the human side. The human side. But then I think... Now, over the years, I haven't resisted on the blood. <laughs> you follow me? Because a church I pastored did something. I never knew how it worked. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. You know, silence. And in those silence time, God wants us to wait. Wait and learn. Watch me. Watch me. The church I pastored wanted to get rid of me. Because they said my preaching and my teaching needed to be in a seminary, not in a church. So they wanted to get rid of me. The first thing they did is started cutting back on the tithes and offerings. And we got to a point that we couldn't hardly pay our bills. That's right, pay a pastor. And so I got the church together and I said, we have a choice to make. If this church is going to survive, we need to think seriously about our tithes and offerings. And that gave a wake-up call, and we started to see them tithes and offerings come back in. 
That didn't work. I'm still there. Here we go again. The congregation started whittling down because I had people in the church going to people discouraging them to come as long as I'm there. <laughs> so, 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 so they couldn't get me on that and I'm still here. Even though our congregation got smaller, I'm still there. The next thing they did is started on my family. And that was the male. That was the male. But even though the male was being pounded in, I had to talk to the Lord. And I cried many times in my office. And the Lord says, just watch. Watch. And one day, I, I never forget it, in my office, I was praying about it and really hurt because of how they were hurting my family. And the Lord said, it's time. It's time. Yes. Brother Johnson, I had two churches <clears throat> where I was physically told that if you don't leave, when we tell you to leave, you will be carried out. One church, they took a vote that was against their Bibles to get rid of me, and they got rid of me. The first church that it happened in, the church stood with the pastor. It slid down the middle. Mm -hmm. By the time I left that church to come up here, we were back up to where we were prior to the split. God had his hand mm -hmm. in all of that. People don't realize the threats that come against the pastor mm -hmm. if the pastor is doing what a certain individual within the church wants to do. They judge by one thing and they, let, they look past God's will mm -hmm. instead of their own will. Okay. Yeah, and that still goes on still goes on when you have control, congregational control, family control, mainly. And so what he's told Joshua, he's told the preachers the same thing. He's told preachers the same thing. You stand and you wait and you watch. Then he goes on and he says, be strong. Now the word strong here is a kind of a double take. But, but it's more than just courage. It's the energy and the convictions. Okay? Be strong and of a great courage. For under this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Do we learn anything here? Okay, if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, it repeats itself over and over and over and over again. In Christ, in Him, in Him, in Christ, in Him. Clear down through that. Waking us up to the reality that this is not our ball game. This is His league. This is His team. Okay? And if you go on and read down to it, we have an inheritance in Christ. Christ is going to share his inheritance with us. Isn't that great? It's not mine. It's his. So notice here, he says, Joshua, he says, now here's what you're going to do. He said, under this people, they are going to divide for an inheritance the land. That land belonged to God. That's God's land. Do you ever wonder why it has never been really destroyed? It's God's land. He took his people off his land because of disobedience. He brought his people back to his land and sometime between 
We don't know when, but AD 48, until when Jesus comes, he's going to take us up, and then he's going to take his people after he deals with the wicked people, and he's going to put them right back in his land. His land. So what we learn here, the land belongs to God. It's his land. Whose church is this? We're supposed to be saying it's the Lord's church. Right here you see division. Not division as far as division in a church that we would call, but a dividing. And the children of Israel go into land, 11 sections of this land is going to be divided for each tribe. There's one tribe that has no inheritance. Which one was that? Levi. Levi. Because God is their inheritance. Yes, the people were to take care of them by providing portions of land so they have a place to live and they can rear their crops and they can have their sheep and they can have their goats and they can have... God allowed that. But he says, I'm your inheritance. But isn't it amazing today that that concept is still true? That we belong to Christ? As, I, as a pastor, I belong to him. Not anybody else. And one day, I'm going to be with him, so are you. But my position is going to be recognized in some proportion I don't know. He said, you're going to rule over many. I don't understand. I can't compute that. I can't get up my hands on that. But he's saying what? He said, you follow me and you trust me and you walk with me. He said, I have this taken care of. But you aren't home yet. <laughs> Are you following me? He goes on and he says, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all all the law, to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou mayest, excuse, that thou mayest prosper whatsoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night. Thou shalt uh, mayest observe to do all that is written within, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have great success. What did you tell him to do? There was a man here in our church that told me preachers don't do anything. They're lazy. And he said they just do two sermons on Sunday and one on Wednesday. Well, at that time I was teaching Sunday school. I was preaching. I was teaching BTC and I was preaching. So there's four. Two lessons and two sermons. Wednesday I was preaching. So I said, what are you, what, what are you doing tomorrow? He said, I got a day off. I said, I'm going to pick you up. I picked him up at 6.30 in the morning. And what I did at 6.30 in the morning, I, I got out. People were going to work, and I met them while they were going to work. At the coffee shops. At the, at the gas stations. I got to know a lot of people. A lot of people got to know me by my face and by my actions. And I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of them. But I was out there. So we stopped and got a cup of coffee. And so forth, and here we started in. About noon, he was ready to go home. I said, no, 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 no. I said, we're going by my house. We're going to grab a sandwich. I got four hours study time. Get ready for Wednesday. I said, it's for Sunday. I need 12 to 17 hours. So I said, no, I'm not taking you home. <laughs> I finally took him home. He never said that to me again. <clears throat> our expectation of our pastors is terrible. Yes, the pastor is supposed to do the work of God, and they're supposed to do the work of an evangelist. So they are doing that. 
while they're contacting people and so forth like that. But if we take them away from one of the most top priorities, studying the Word of God, I'm not a know-it-all. I know a lot. I still study today. Every day I study, I think, I work out. I got questions and answers. I'm still looking for answers. I can sit and I can listen to a preacher and not to be a know-it-all, I know when he's off base. I know when he hasn't studied. He's stuck. And he won't get unstuck. I know when all that happens. And it irritates me, but I can't do anything about it. I can't. The only thing I can do is suggest to get unstuck at times. The preachers, when they leave seminary, think their study is all over. No, 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 no. All you did in seminary is get the, got the tools. And now you get the tools to work to see what the Word of God is saying. Now listen, the Word of God at times is just for the individual. And preachers have to learn that this is my sermon. This is what God's talking to me. And at and that moment you have a spirit. I'm going to preach this. No, 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 no. That's for you. That's for me. Okay? That's what we learn in the Word of God. And then the Spirit of God works. I want you to preach this. I don't know how many times in my office my whole thought pattern changed. And I had to listen. And when my thought pattern changed, a whole brand new sermon came up. Saturday, when I thought it was already settled Wednesday. <laughs> Sunday morning. Yeah, Sunday morning. I got called at Three Rivers <coughs> at uh, 8.30. To go to Three Rivers, we have to leave at 9 o'clock. Could you come? Our pastor's sick. Uh, <laughs> went in the office, got down on my knees and said, Lord, what? And I, I still today amazed. A thought comes to your heart. And you go and start jotting down. And then you get there, you're not fully, fully jotted down yet. But he brings it in. I have learned to be the follower and let him be the leader in everything I've been doing. I'm learning that, still learning that. And that's exactly what he's been telling Joshua. And that's exactly what he's been telling us in the New Testament. Pastors right on down. See? Are we listening? Are we following? Are we doing? No? Because we get stuck. Any questions? Joshua was put in this Bible for us. Pardon? Joshua was put in this Bible for us to look at and learn. Everything. Apply it to ourselves. Okay, but if you take Joshua and put it over here in the Old Testament and never move it across, what do you learn? Right. Say, that's what I'm getting at. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? It became a religious thing only for preachers being ordained. That's where the concept started disappearing. A lot of churches before that became the stronghold, they were laying on hands. Anyone that joined the church, they not only accepted them through baptism, after baptism they laid the hands on them. Because that was an, the church is a very important institution, and it belongs to God, not man. That's why. Okay? There was a time when people, maybe not this type of laying on hands, but after someone was baptized, the church members went past, shook their hand, welcoming them as part of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way we had carried it for years. That's how it was moved down right. to that point. And how many people went by and shook their hand? This one lady walked up to this little girl. She, this, this girl, she was saved and baptized, and this lady walked up and said, Darling, you're so full of joy right now, but you'll soon get over it. Maybe the church member. See, so what I'm saying is you have to be careful because even those shaking hands, they have their second thought. See? And says somebody was really a sinner and they walk in here and they give their heart to the Lord and we baptize them and, and you're coming by, what's in your thinking? I'm not going to endorse him. I'm not going to endorse her. 
they're a sinner. No, when somebody walks in that door, gives their heart to the Lord, I don't care if it's outside or in, and they follow the Lord in baptism, when they become a part of that body, they're a part of the body. We're all together in this thing. You follow me? Because we remember 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there were some in Corinthians that were very bad people. But the Lord changed them and was changing them. So we have to get off of our judgmental attitudes at times and say, praise God. Praise God. Because when a soul is saved, don't angels rejoice in heaven? Amen. Much less doing the work of the Lord. Anything else? What was the reason for the first removal of Israel people from their land? Sin? Disobedience? Rebellion? It's all right there. He took them into captivity because of it. And then he took them off his land because of the very same thing. If you study it, even the leaders started getting drunk. Down on the bottom of the temple, they had their own little secret place where they, they were worshiping idols. So that was the main reason of going into Babylonian captivity to teach them not to do it again. They came back, even Israel now is not worshiping a God, but they have one. It's called materialism. Materialism. Everything is daughter. Everything is a daughter. They're not back to God yet. Why? Because they're still in that slumber. Until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, then God will open their eyes. But right now, they're sound asleep. See? So that's why. Rebellion. Disobedience. Okay? Anything else? Okay, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. With our heads bowed, Frank.